you can learn about Dungeons and Dragons with better buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ. With us this week, it's John. Hello. And James. Hello, hello, hello. Who's the third person you group? Um, the Lord. Is he in the room with us right now, James? Lord who? He's, uh, uh, <laughs> sweat, sweats Catholicly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> Not without five years of intensive yeah. doctoral study. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm going to have mm-hmm. to ask ask a lady in the sky for intercession. She's going to have to help me out. We can figure this out. Got to write to the Pope. Ask yeah. A the questions. Pope knows. <laughs> the Pope knows a lot, apparently. I, Pope really you just likes reminded me of something. Pope. So last week I recommended... Or, yeah, last time we recorded, I recommended the Da Vinci Code, and I was reading the Wikipedia article of, like, factual, like, the Da Vinci Code criticisms. It was basically like, here's the fact check on the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> and I learned that there is a time where popes are, in fact, not the voice of the, like, god church. Like, uh-huh. you can be pope, but if, or, like, former pope, or what have you, or about to be pope, but there is a at some level time period where you are not just the voice of God on earth. So yeah, cool. You're saying stuff, but that doesn't make it legit. Is this before you're officially declared a, a Pope? I'm assuming. I'd have to go back and double check if it was before you're officially declared Pope or if it's like, Oh, somebody else is Pope, but you didn't die. And so you're no longer that voice. So who cares? Mm-hmm. Really makes you have faith in the institution. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this because this is this is as someone who would like nominally define themselves as Catholic, at least in their upbringing and slightly practicing now. Like I struggle immensely, actually, with the whole like you have to, you know, if you're Catholic, like you have to um, agree with like the supremacy of the Pope. I mean, like there's something God's word on Earth. Yeah, it's just like, and I was like thinking about that more intensely recently because, like, my normal position is like, fuck that. Like, that sounds like a load of horseshit that somebody who would want to be seen as a god on earth would say. It feels incredibly manipulative and cynical. And at the very least, it's like e- really easy to abuse. And it clearly has been abused just like multiple times. Um,. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you finish your point. But I have a joke. yeah, no, I I just and then I kind of realized, like I guess, like I you... just realized I meant indulgent. Oh yeah, well I mean the time still, you know, it's still yeah, it's I mean whatever I mean, but the like the thing for me is like uh, what was I what was I gonna fucking say? I guess like by getting to the position of Pope, like there's an argument to be made that like, see, like, am I not in some way like divinely chosen? Like how many people have tried to get here? How many people have not? And like, I'm one of the ones who like did get here. So I see, I do see an argument for like Providence in that. I just have a really serious issue. You mean the Providence that a bunch of dudes in robes sat around a table and put some smoke out a chimney? Well, (laughs) it's just, it's because I get it where it's like, because what would the argument be against the Pope? The argument would be like, what are you supposed to say that like God and man can be the same thing? And it's like, yeah, that's kind of the whole idea behind the religion, you know? That's not what the the Pope is, though. Well, he's supposed to be the voice of God on earth. He's supposed to be the, the, he intercedes for us on behalf of us to God. Yeah, but it's it's supposed to be like a, oh, you are you're divinely you got the holy spirit blessing shit going on so like you're not you or yourself are not divine you just have that divine helping hand yeah i just but usually okay fair enough i mean i always took it as like he's the like i mean he's essentially you know i mean he's the the heir to peter's to jesus's throne yeah i mean exactly saints are divine but they are not divinity 
he's kind of i think he's like the pope is almost actually like in between a saint and an apostle because he's inheriting the seat of like it's an apostolic throne by definition no, because you can be pope and not saint and you can be saint and not pope yeah but i I, what i'm saying is higher because they have performed miracles I don't. I don't think you have to like necessarily. Maybe they're in their own class. Then I think popes that, are below saints. So that, you think so? Well, but you can't be a saint until you're dead. So, and you have to have performed at least two miracles. Yeah, Ooh, I the first millennial witnessed. saint is uh, is gonna happen. By the way, learned about this that a couple weeks ago. Inflation. The uh, the first millennial to be named a saint is under review. He has his second miracle. Uh, he was very prolific in uh, evangelizing through social media and websites and cataloging modern miracles and things. And the second miracle is that somebody went and prayed at his tomb and their daughter, her like, I don't know if it was like a brain bleed clot or some other brain problem just wasn't there anymore. It went away. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So it's a posthumous miracle. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's Which, gotta be, like, uh, one I of the most it, popular forms, I was right? kind of like, mm, I'm not the one who has to make that decision, so, like, whatever they yeah. decide, that's that's their right to make that decision. I don't know if that's really, I don't know if that's really his miracle, though, you know? It, I mean, you can't say one way or another. It happened it's at true. his tomb. He may have had some influence. But it's not like he's walking around doing it, you know? Like, I, that is one of the Not things that's the always apocalypse. one of the things that's always stuck with me a little bit about like the sainthood is the like mm. oh cool people were performing miracles up until science and then the miracles dried yeah. up real fast I uh, see I like I do think that you know like two phrases is like uh what any any anything so technologically advanced like beyond a certain point would appear to be as like magic and you if like if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree like it's going to fail every time and like with the first one it's like i think like maybe in many ways you could actually describe what goes on in science as miraculous like you can use religious terminology to like structure scientific thought and it doesn't necessarily change like the outcome as long as you don't fiddle with like the actual mechanics of the scientific process. Okay. Um, two, like, I do think that, like, using, like, scientific frameworks to judge or to evaluate, like, religious occurrences, it's accurate if you're trying to disprove maybe, like, physical phenomena or trying to discredit, like, you know, the classic, like, discrediting someone who's, who's, clearly lying or trying to manipulate or deceive people like i think that that makes complete sense to me but i think like part of the whole uh nature of religious experiences or occurrences is that they are um simultaneous like they're uh they're intuitive like and they're uh they are observable but they're also like subjective like i do think there's an objective quality to like a religious experience. Yeah. Um, uh, but it also requires a, a lot of like just intuition in the same way that I think science requires like an inherent uh, inclination towards like logical structuring and pattern recognition and sort of, you know, being able to see where the chain may go after the next link. I think like intuition is almost kind of like it's like how quickly your eyes adjust to seeing in the dark. It's like being able to feel out the shape of something and try to deduce like what's there. Um, and slowly over the course of like practicing it, that sense of, of kind of touch below the surface gets better, but it's something that has to be like practiced, which is why I think people who haven't like experienced it or don't reside in that part of their brain as often like it's very easy to discredit because it's something that's like more subtextual. Whereas I think science deals with like almost the grammar of life rather than the qualitative meaning of the words in the book. Yes. And if I followed anything of what you just said, Mm -hmm. I think you're correct on a, particularly when you go into the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. 
However, the Bible was pretty specific as to what things were miracles. And, like, my dude turning water into wine instantaneously. Yeah, I don't, I go, I don't got no science to explain that. And, like, some of the other stuff that, like, again, there's a lot of stuff, like you said, like, just because you can explain why something happened scientifically doesn't mean it's any less necessarily miraculous at, holy cow, this is so cool that the world works like this. I love that part. I'm totally yeah, with that. I, That's awesome. It's the I, like, I totally agree. It's the like, okay, maybe we need to acknowledge some of these may not have like necessarily been quite as miraculous as we presumed before we understood the world. That like, yeah, yeah there probably are still miracles that happened, but you may want to revise what you considered a miracle. I can agree with that. I mean, like, there's a part in, uh, I think it's like exodus or deuteronomy it's like one of the early books in the bible when they're wandering around the desert uh i think it's actually leviticus because that's the book of like all the rules and it tells you like exact like how to do all this stuff um one of the things they it tells you how to do is like how to disinfect your house after a sickness and it literally involves like you need to find a running stream and two sparrows and a bucket and you're going to take the bucket and fill it with water partially from the running stream. Then you're going to decapitate one of the sparrows. I could, I, I'm definitely misremembering parts of this, but the general idea is here. You're going to decapitate one of the sparrows and let the blood pool in the bucket. Then you're going to take the other sparrow, which is still alive, dunk its head in the bucket, and then like a like a holy water like sprinkler. You're going to go throughout your home. And you're going to sprinkle this like sparrow blood fuck? water all over your home what the fuck? and that's supposed like then you that's leave it sit magic. for a little bit yeah i i don't know like what i because like they don't explain necessarily in the bible like there's no there's no further notation like this is why that's this some is real like, pagan why shit this. it's very it's very archaic i'm sure in a way that there was some kind of very arcane uh you know like they happened to put some water on it that washed away some germs pot like <laughs> yeah and it has it has an element of sacrifice in a lot of older cultures like it you know there was the belief that like you know sacrifice served the purpose of like showing a kind of like reverence for life and the understanding that there's a transactional nature there's a kind of exchange going on consistently can you imagine being that why... sparrow though that's like being used to whip water around a tent <laughs> Like, yeah, you're stuck in this dude's hand. He's dun- he's yeah. waterboarding you as he's like dunking your head in the bucket, and he's whipping you around the tent as the water flies off of you. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I've really loved. Wait, what are you doing with me? Wait, hold on. Wait, on. But- Joan, Why am no. I covered in my friend's blood. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> oh my god. Poor guy. What do they do with the bird afterwards? It's traumatized. I'm gonna throw up. I'm gonna throw up. Oh, shit. I'm a bird. I can't throw up. This is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. I have no vomit and I must puke. <laughs> what do you mean birds can't throw up? I'm pretty sure birds yeah, they can. don't typically throw up. I mean, they feed their young by vomiting it in their mouths. That's a different throw up. They can't throw up for a moment. Now I gotta look it up. Right. Do sparrows vomit? I mean, I'm no bird expert, but do sparrows? <laughs> that is my understanding vomit. of how they feed baby birds. You're the closest thing we have to a bird expert here, John. You've Vomiting in birds is always abnormal. Uh, well, what? hang on. At times, birds may regurgitate, that is, expel food originating from the crop through the mouth, but this is undigested mm. food. Oh. Now that okay, being said. Birds do, in fact, vomit. And according to birdclinic.net, the answer is yes. Um, Hard-hitting facts here today. The... That's, pretty, that's pretty cool. <laughs> this, it that's... was just going to tell me yes, and then it didn't just tell me yeah. Okay, the answer is Dude, yes, that's... but it's different from mammals. Birds don't have a diaphragm, so there's no abdominal contractions. And many birds can vomit voluntarily. No, hang on, the other website said the crop is not the vomit. How do they br- how do they breathe then? Like, oh, birds, don't you need a diaphragm? No, they have a diaphragm, but they don't have um, 
No, I don't have a diaphragm. What time? How do birds breathe without a diaphragm? Hang on, we're doing another Google. Are they like? Are How they like jet engines? Birds... Do they just fly and suck in uh, air? Yeah, <laughs> I was like... gonna say. Do they just? How do yeah, birds breathe without yeah. a diaphragm? Um, <laughs> air is helped into and out of the body by special muscles attached to the rib cage and sternum, moving them downward and upward, downward and forward when breathing in, and then up and backward when breathing out. So they just have a lot of diaphragms. Sounds like a yeah. distributed diaphragm. <laughs> yeah, they birds got get that. more than one yeah. diaphragm. What the fuck? That's pretty sick. Oh, I mean, it makes it makes sense. There's no room structurally like for a diaphragm in an animal that flies. I bet a bat has it, but a bat is usually. Bats I feel amazing. like they're a little more complex. Yeah. Bats just a rat with yeah. wings. I don't know what you want. Birds are birds are just birds. Birds tweeting. are dinosaurs. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Our better buddy's icebreaker this week. Oh, yeah. All right, let's do it. <laughs> What's the best practical joke that you've played on someone or that was played on you? And my answer is uh, the Catholic Church. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, snap. RJ's, RJ, you know, we need to get you one of those uh, comedy special uh, album know, covers where... You're like handcuffed with caution tape, and it's over your mouth. And <laughs> we'll crucify you like they did with Ricky Gervais on microphone stands. It'll, it'll be awesome. No, be really no, cool. no. Catholic Church has done a lot of good. It's it's a complicated organization, complicated history. Yeah. They opened up all those young men to the wonders of the faith. I mean... What do you mean by that? <laughs> 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 I, I don't know exactly. if I want to know what you mean by that. That is exactly. I mean true. exactly what I said. Yeah, <laughs> that, in no. multiple meanings. <laughs> no uh, underlying message there. Just exactly verbatim. Exactly, exactly what I said. I think it's. I think it's applicable. You know. I think it's. I think it's multifaceted. Mm. Many layers. Soon they're going to make a Mark Ruffalo movie about you. Oh. <laughs> Well, they are, yeah, they've already had uh, what's his face? Who's the fucking who's Marky Mark from Wahlberg? the Fucky Bunch? Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, they already had him as a priest, right? So, oh yeah, Father Stu. Father Stu. I wanted to yeah. see that. I haven't seen it. Yeah. All I knew I was, was it was like that, a uh, former criminal becomes spotlight. a priest. Yeah. Yeah, I I would like actually. I think there should be a spotlight movie with Mark Ruffalo as an investigative journalist and Mark Wahlberg being the guy he's uh, investigating. that he's investigating. Yeah. Yeah. What's There's a new I'm movie sure th- coming out soon. And I want to say is Mark Wahlberg and George Clooney, but it might be Brad Pitt and George. Yeah, I know. Sure. I've seen the trailer Wolves. on YouTube, but I haven't clicked on it. I've just seen the, thumbnail it's, i did watch the trailer the other day and it's a very fun dumb trailer of like action movie like it starts off taking itself so seriously and it keeps itself serious that entire time because it's aware that this is not going to be serious um yeah but it, the basic premise is that george clooney is a fixer and this woman okay. like comes home to her apartment and there's a body in there and she's like oh my god like I, this needs to be taken care of. Like, what the what the fuck do I do? Like, my husband said, like, to call this number if I ever had a problem. And I, I called it, finally. And George Clooney comes in and is, like, cleaning up the body and the crime scene and all that stuff and taking care of it. And then Mark Wahlberg walks in, in the exact same <laughs> outfit, with the exact same blue gloves, to do the same thing. <laughs> and George Clooney's like, wait, no, I'm the only one who does what I do. Nobody else does what I do. And it turns out, no... Somebody else does what you do, dude. Don't tell Mark Wahlberg no. <laughs> Don't do it. So it's very much that whole, like, oh, they're both lone wolves, but they're such clones of each other. Yeah, I love that. I was, I, when I saw the thumbnail, I wondered if it was going to be, like, a, kind of a Ocean's Eleven sort of... It's more tongue-in-cheek. Riff, yeah. Uh, but the best practical joke I've ever played... Um, So I think... The one that I I always think I just got away with because I was a little kid and they let me was I can I told my father that I could pin a cup of water to the wall <laughs> that I had this styrofoam cup like I had this cup of water and it wasn't styrofoam it was like plastic cup of water and I could pin it to the wall with a pin 
and I asked him to hold the pin, and then I dumped the water on his head. <laughs> and then did you pin it to the wall? No. Um, Damn. But the best one that was just me on my own is I pulled a full-on Pokemon Jigglypuff and drew on my dad's face with washable marker uh, while he was sleeping. I was like, RJ, eight, seven. You, you little rat monster, <laughs> RJ. Well, here's, oh the, here's the real kicker that I didn't know because I was a goddamn child. Um, my dad had a show that day. Oh, and that's thank so Christ! Funny. I'd used like literally like one of those, uh, yeah, one of those Crayola washable black markers. Because <laughs> my Holy my shit. dad got up and I he wasn't like mad at me, but mm. I re- I distinctly remember the like talking to my mom after he left, and my mom was like, "So what'd you do?" <laughs> and she's like, "Yeah, good thing you used the washable marker." <laughs> Casual fall asleep vandalism. fall asleep it'll show you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i did like the full like i drew glasses on his face i drew a mustache on i put a scar on his chin like this was not just like just... a little mark this was i drew this was should've, elaborate should have just worked it into the show you know yeah that would have been good <laughs> yeah rolled with it i damn I'm trying to think of any practical jokes. That were... Ooh, I will say one of the best April Fool's jokes my mom did. Um, she did a breakfast one time that was a fake breakfast. Uh, oh, no. So all the foods looked like other foods. So instead of, like, fried eggs, it was two patches of, like, vanilla yogurt in the shape of eggs with half a peach on top. Half, like, yeah. a canned peach. So it looked like a fried egg. I distinctly remember that. That one was pretty, pretty good. good. I like that. That's creative. What about y'all? I'm not a huge like, practical joke person. I'm trying to think here. I think it's because a part of the problem I find with practical jokes is it used to just be okay to beat the shit out of your friends. Yeah. And we've kind of realized, yeah. like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Because, like, a lot of prop comedy is somebody's going to get hurt. Um... And, like, practical jokes have to walk that real fine line of we're impeding your life in a way you are not expecting, but it's not such an impediment that you are having problems because of it. Yeah, it's got to, it is a, you're right, it's a very fine line between, like, it's almost got to be, like, you, theoretically, you could have avoided this outcome, but also... Like, there was no way that you were getting out of it. There's got to be, like, a simultaneous... You just can't get hurt by it, right? Like, you can't hurt them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think there has to be a simultaneous, like, inevitability and, like, kind of voluntary uh, participation in a practical joke on behalf of the the victim. Um, I always really really... like the uh, sticky noting someone's office. Oh, like, putting them all over and stuff like that? That's a classic. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I'm sure the swim team had some stuff. Um, those those weren't jokes. That was just torture. Was just yeah, <laughs> I can't. Yeah, real full metal jacket shit. Um, I can't. I can't recall honestly. I get scared all the time. Uh, I, I fucking love to do it. One of my roommates does, and my my uh, siblings will do it too. Where it's just like I'm around the corner, just being like, bah! Um, uh, and I had like lose my shit every time Um, yeah i'm a dangerous person to do that too yeah i am i am as i'm not a dangerous person but i i will i'll freak out a little bit i don't know i'm really not the last time somebody intentionally like scared me like that i had pulled a fist back to swing (laughs) like my arm had come up my elbow was back (laughs) no i didn't good to know about to deck a young mother with a stroller uh, just in the middle of the street. More just like turn a corner and he didn't see. More like deck one of my few black coworkers. So it was a good <laughs> thing I didn't. Yikes. Perfect. No, that do that. You should do that. That's great. Charles Manson wants you to do it, actually. Um I don't care yeah, what about Charles Manson. We should do reasons, what Charles Manson wants to do. You should do you should do what Charles Manson wants you to do. Yeah. My uh, my the head of my department got practical joke played on him really good last year. Um, one of the uh middle people in the department 
uh, while he was out at a conference, got everybody together to do really cheesy, like, 90s family photos. Mm. Where we all, like, dressed up the same and then posed together. And she hid those photos all over his office. <laughs> both oh, blatantly cute. and completely hidden. Uh, I believe at one point there was, like, a hundred photos. Yeah. Awesome. I would not be surprised to find out there are still some somewhere in that office. I, uh... I had a few from college, not like super practical joke or anything, more just like a circle of hiding things oh. <laughs> um, on people. So one iteration yeah. was we had like this big Costco sized jar of pickles, okay, uh, which was, you know, hard to hide. Yeah. Um, it had ended up in somebody's t-shirt drawer and it was there for like four months Oh no! before they noticed it. It was sealed, like it wasn't bad or anything. How did they That's not pickles, notice? Like, I don't. I guess I didn't go in there very often. <laughs> that makes me worried. Um, <laughs> it's hilarious. I think they had two t-shirt drawers, and they just okay. either pulled from the front or used the other one primarily. But um, the other one was like a little cereal box toy troll, <laughs> um, and that was much more fun. And that went a, a lot longer until somebody lost it. Nice. I had it like it was my turn to find it for a while. It was like in our reserve toilet paper in the middle of a tube and I, it took me a long time to find that yeah that's that's never getting found <laughs> i've got a i don't know if this one counts though but um, yeah i mean there was this thing that i used to do um have you guys ever heard of the game god fucking damn it james what is that <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is greatest one right now. Yes, I did it. It's recorded for posterity. <sighs> it's bad. RJ Luce's decade streak. I've not heard that name, and actually, I've heard it in the last like five years. I think. What it's the half a decade streak? Damn, dude. Yeah, sorry about that. Are you though? Are not you really. though? I'm happy. Uh, does it count? Is that is that technically a practical joke? I, I think that is a prank. Yeah. Just a All prank, right. Bro. Just a prank, bro. No, it's, it's a war crime, actually. If you're <laughs> going to jail. Yeah, come on. Everybody knows it's only a prank if you're filming it for YouTube and you're significantly inconveniencing somebody who is just a pedestrian on the street. Yeah. If you're not ruining a stranger's day, it's not funny. Damn That's how pranks right. work. Mm -hmm. Damn right. Um, yeah, but that's. Reasons. That was a that's prank. about what I would do. That's 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 about the extent of my pranking slash practical joking. I would say. See, and I, I live a dangerous lifestyle of, I am avoiding pranks because I know if I prank, just about anybody I in my immediate vicinity, I will be pranked in return and usually tenfold. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're afraid of the retaliation. Because there will be retaliation. He's afraid of the escalation. There will be. John's right. It is the escalation <laughs> that I I fear. Simple tit for tat, no problem. <laughs> Starting a war. <laughs> That's a issue. bit more of an endeavor. <laughs> yeah. Big issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Ugh. Our next segment is better buddies recommend, where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy. Who would like to start? Can I actually please go? No. I have something burning. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I have something burning. Um, okay, so I started about a week ago ish uh, a rewatch of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Oh boy. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and oh, man. Uh, I'm having like uh -oh. a religious experience here, bro. So I'm having like a, a full on fucking uh, uh, God is speaking to me through Hideaki Anno's uh, 1995 masterpiece. Yeah. Um, I love it. I actually, so I have, I watched this series with Calvin for the first time uh, when him and I were living together in Whitewater. And I remember liking it and being like wow that was actually really impressive but it did not leave much of an impression i was glad that i had seen like a classic movie or a classic show and i guess a movie as well with the end of evangelion movie which we watched <clears throat> excuse me as well but uh 
yeah, I, I remember just kind of like, I was like, oh, cool. All right. Um, but rewatching it this time. Oh my God. I am seriously like, I am blown away. I think it might be the best show I've ever seen. I, I mean, like I, I know I say that like a lot, um, but it is, uh, it's awesome. Like there is a feeling of emptiness and like adolescence and kind of um, sort of like a classic quality to the show. And I would like really highly recommend if you haven't seen it, I would recommend watching it. If you've watched it before, like this is your sign to go do a rewatch. It's a, it's a great summer show, honestly. Um, and I've really enjoyed uh, my experience, like going through it again. It's been simply sublime. Okay. I, yeah, I need to, I, sh- I should probably take you up on watching it again. Um, I would, yeah. You've seen it before, Ben? Yeah, I think, like, I think the first time I watched it, it was between <clears throat> graduating college and starting my first job, and I just, like, binged it in the summer. Mm-hmm. It is definitely, it's one that I would say, like, I would say watch an episode a day, no more than three, is what I would say. Like, no. reflect on it. Yeah, give yourself, treat each one like a small movie or like a little event, because there is a lot that happens, and they're very, like, um, they're just so good. I I, can't pull a How I Met Your Mother or Scrubs and just binge all of it at once, so I barely comprehend uh, any nuance or detail. Uh, I am. That is what I'm saying. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry. No, I just like I. I actually wonder too, um, because like, uh, I actually genuinely wonder the the thing I had forgotten about the show that I really liked, and I don't feel like this is a spoiler because it's it's pretty evident from the very first episode. I forget how like. Um, you know, in the backstory of the show, it's like, oh, you know, we're following these kids who fight these robots to fight these, like, uh, uh, beings called angels that are coming uh, down from the sky. And they're they're basically, they're, they're trying to extinguish the last of, like, humankind, um, who's all, like, holed up in uh, Tokyo, um, Tokyo and there are three. other places. Tokyo 3. I'm trying not to be too technical. I'm trying to <laughs> keep it keep it accessible. Um, Sorry. <laughs> and no, no, it's fine. And it all it all started because of this event that happened in Antarctica called the Second Impact, which was like a global event where there was this huge explosion that happened in Antarctica because of something a research team was doing down there and it just totally fucked the planet over, uh, like killed billions of people and set humanity back. And like in 15 years humanity has like rebuilt Right. And they're kind of like, it's, it's interesting because it's like a post apocalypse where the world isn't so much destroyed as it is just empty. And I forgot about that quality of emptiness because like they still have like trains and skyscrapers and planes and cars and kids are going to school and there's TV shows and all, all the stuff like it's, all the trappings of the modern world, but it's in, it's, it's in the twilight of ostensibly the end of the human race. Like it's, it's, it's a world that, that is after the apocalypse and possibly approaching a new one. Um, And I just forgot like how the show portrays those levels of like emptiness commingled with kind of like a lot of the adults in the show, uh, you know, like being very dogmatic and like, this is how we're going to fix the world. And, um, and at the same time, they're very clueless and the kids are kind of like innocent a little bit, you know, they're going on field trips and they're developing crushes and they're listening to music and they're doing all this, but they're also kind of plagued with this like responsibility of being possibly the last generation on earth. Um, like it's the end of the world, you know? And, they're still going to school. Um, And I just forgot how it really dealt with like these very like potent themes of like mortality. uh, Like I said before, like emptiness, adolescence, uh, innocence against the backdrop of apocalypse is like one phrase that comes to mind that I really like. And I really encourage that you watch it. I honestly think too, the series has resonance after 
something like uh, uh, not to be too whatever, but like after something like uh, COVID um, and Corona and all that, and knowing what the world looks like empty, some of these scenes have like a, a higher resonance because it's it it sets off some triggers and. Yeah. I, I also do think it's interesting as one last thing, like a lot of the kids who are growing up in this world are like 14 because the series takes place in the year 2015. Mm. Um, oh, the shit. events that like, I know, right. The, the distant future, um, and the events that the second impact took place in like 2000, and, you know, so they had 15 years to rebuild. So why and okay? I well, what I thought was really interesting was like it's a story about a generation of children who are growing up like uh, after like after this event has taken place that has completely reshaped the world that they live in. Um, and I honestly just thought like not to be too whatever, but I thought that was that almost makes it a perfect show for uh, anyone our age and younger given our kind of like bizarre relationship to like something like nine yeah. 11. And I don't mean to be too like whatever here, but I think it's a very interesting parallel where it's like, it's like, Oh, these kids who are like being, you know, kind of pressured into maneuvering these vast technological systems in order to fend off, like, you know, uh, spiritual enemies of humankind are being like manipulated by the crotchety older generation who really has like, nothing better to do than just plot a mass suicide. <laughs> oh, fun. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, like these kids are kind of grappling with like, you know, their innocence and their, their individuality and the pain that comes with like living as well as also just, again, typical kid stuff like going on field trips or falling in love or, you know, um, it's, it's such an awesome show. It's, I, I, I cannot, cannot recommend it enough i think it actually has an immense resonance and cultural cash for like uh i think it's truly a show that can be enjoyed by almost anyone in our generation or will have like a resonance it is very weird and it's very confused at times but it is just such a beautiful show so i would please please if you have not seen it just watch the first episode of neon genesis neon genesis evangelion Watch it in the original Japanese with English subtitles. It's the best way to do it. Um, and uh, see what you think. All right. Mm. That's something else. I think I watched it dubbed. So. Yeah, you gotta. I, I, I don't. I've never seen the dub, so I can't. I can't comment. I know there's like a bunch out there, but I would. I would watch it sub. They have it on Netflix, and it's like the original sub translation too. So it's not like a. It's like the original translation, I believe, that came out in '95. Oh, so, interesting. I th I think so. I think so. Uh, like I kind of cross compared. So um, yeah. John, would you like to go next, or shall I? Uh, you can. I'm still kind of unprepared. So I'm going to recommend the Marvel Comics crossover event, Fear Itself. Uh, it came out in the 2010s, late 2010s. Like 2015, somewhere in, in um, the basic premise is that the Red Skull's daughter Sin finds a hammer that crashed to Earth in the Arctic during World War II, and becomes the uh, herald, I guess, for the Asgardian uh, entity known as the Serpent, the God of Fear. Uh, and it turns out that Odin had f it's o Odin's brother. Odin had faced down this god of fear once before and basically wiped the earth clean uh, because the god of fear gets his strength from pe when people are afraid. And so Odin basically says, all right, well, fuck at earth, fuck Midgard. We're going to go back to Asgard real quick and build up our armies and engines of war to wipe the face of the earth clean again. And the heroes of earth said, hey, wait a minute, what? You can't do that. We live here. Um... <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, hang on. Just don't be afraid. Easy um, solution. Yeah. So the Odin basically looks at them and says, okay, you have until the armies of the serpent uh, fall in the shadow of the world tree, uh, and if you fail by that point, we're destroying the earth. Congratulations. Um, one of the other things that made it difficult was there were seven other hammers that fell 
they were called down by the serpent god and so each of these hero hammers went to a person uh hulk got one and was the breaker of worlds the thing was the breaker of rocks um it was basically like a bunch of strength based heroes but they weren't like just the strongest heroes they were very interesting choices um the gray gargoyle who is a marvel villain who his touch can turn people to stone got a hammer and was the breaker of souls um and he turned like all of paris to stone so did the hammers like influence them to be on the serpent side yep okay and they all got like thor like boosts so they're all even stronger and more powerful and unable to be damaged and stuff but it was a really fun uh event reading through it with like the tie-ins and the crossovers and like tony stark goes to nidvalir to the dwarves and but in order to do so he like goes to the world tree which is in broxton ohio and <laughs> there was this whole thing where thor like ragnarok <laughs> happened thor brought the gods back but put asgard in broxton ohio and then it was destroyed in the previous crossover event siege and then Odin showed up and was like, all right, Asgardians back to Asgard. Let's go through the world tree. Come on, shoo. Um, but like Tony Stark, desperate to get weapons to help them like even balance out the fight, goes to the world tree, shouts out for Odin and sacrifices his sobriety. Uh, so it's this cool, like in the Iron Man tie-in comics, like it's Iron Man working with the dwarves, but also reckoning with the fact that like he fell off the wagon but he, it's not like he just fell off the wagon because he was stressed. It was he deliberately fell off the wagon and is trying to, like, get back on. And in the process meets one of the, like, head dwarves who is also an alcoholic and admits, like, he, he never realized there was words for, yeah, you drink a lot, but you don't do it because you like it. Um, and so by the end of it, like, has this dwarf friend that he brings back to Earth to go to Alcoholics Anonymous with. Aww. Um, but it's also very, it's definitely one of those, like, I'm a sappy sucker, and so, like, the climax of the fight is they're in Broxton, Ohio, and, like, the civilians are kind of, like, guarding their town a little bit because they're afraid, and Captain America rolls in and is like, okay, this is, this is the big one, this is the fight, anybody who wants to stand with me to defend their town, like, I'll welcome it, but if you're gonna leave to go take shelter, leave your guns, I'm gonna need them. And everybody leaves. Uh, but then, as Captain America and, like, the, the other heroes are around, they're trying. But, like, there's very deliberately, like, Captain America making a one-man stand at the entrance to this town. Uh, one of the guys comes back from the shelter and takes up a gun. In very much the, like, yeah, we got to the shelter, but it didn't sit right with me that we left you out here. Anti-fear. That's yeah. courage. That is courage. So it's, it's literally that. an entire event about courage, and, like, the prophecy is that Thor will die to the serpent, so, like, Thor is pressing onward, knowing he's going to die. Um, so the entire thing is about, like, courage and facing your fears, but it's also very much a commentary on, it must have been 20, maybe it was 2016, but it's, like, totally a very on-the-nose commentary of, like, wow, the world is so afraid of everything these days. Well, huh. I was back in 2015. Wow. Yeah. It's just gotten worse. I don't know if it's gotten worse. It did get worse for a while. I'd say it's gotten a little better. I guess we're more afraid of advertisers than anything at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well. Oh, it was, oh, not even not even 2015. <laughs> this was a 2010-2011 event. So this was... I was wrong. This is like 2010, 2011, start of the 2010s. What was going on? There, n nothing was going on then. It was post-recession. That's what it was. Post-housing market. Yeah. So there was so there was some stuff going on. Yeah. Post-recession. Kind of pulling out of the Middle East. But yeah, it was... Completely. <laughs> of course. I think we forget too, like, I think we forget like how, not to be too whatever, but like we do forget like how for a long time after... 2001 like how edgy the country was like how on edge people were about some of that stuff too. how fear really was like a really big part of american psychology yeah uh well it's one of those things right that do, front like, of mind. based on i don't know about you guys but based on like our upbringing i would say like we didn't experience a lot of it 
it was that like tangential like the adults who knew it was going on experienced it and we yeah. were influenced by that but we didn't understand what who where and where or why it just kind of yeah. was the way the world was yeah yeah you you just knew that we were at war and you knew that like uh i don't think i was ever even really aware of that i i i was certainly I think, not just like because 2000s no not well like around like middle school ish i mean i remember there were there was a time in elementary school where we had to write letters to soldiers like i remember that vividly um you saying that i vaguely remember it but you know and we had we had found we had friends whose parents were you know in the service and that's true i mean it was there but it wasn't like it wasn't something that i feel like was very it was kind of an afterthought war honestly and that's not to, that is not said to like a, at all like you know disregard or disrespect like you know the sacrifices that went on over there i'm sure that you know there's some horrific stuff i'm sure that there was some you know some actually good constructive stuff that went on but i again i think that's just what's interesting about like our generation specifically is we grew up and like uh i mean no one like in this country or in the world could have imagined something like that happening to the United States. And it represented a fundamental phase shift in like kind of global history, honestly. Um, and for us to grow up in the, the epicenter okay. of it. Or, you say yeah. that I'm calling it right now, the next major terrorist attack akin to nine 11 is going to be on a train. You think so? Like a dude, I can trains see have train no security. Dr- Train derailment, I could see. I mean, that's what people were saying with that one. And that when happened I was one getting day. on my wow. train out of Chicago to go back home, the only security was if you see something, say something, like if a bag is left unattended, and there was a dog. It was the only time I'd seen a dog, like police dog of any kind, the entire time I was on trains. Damn. Yeah. Right, we had to go and ruin trains for all of this. Now we're getting trained, TSA. I honestly kind of was surprised that there wasn't... I fully expected train TSA. Like, the website said, like, oh, you just show up, like, 30 minutes beforehand just to make sure you board on time. I was like, nah. Nah, it's too easy. There's gotta be more to it. And I showed up, and there wasn't. Possible. Yeah, trains are nice. They are nice. I love trains. So don't ruin them. Yeah. Yeah, you hear that? I would say that's Al Qaeda, but Al Qaeda is too busy making spreadsheets in Kabul to really do anything else right now. Oh, uh, John, what do you yeah, want to recommend? Man. I don't know how I'm going to follow um, <laughs> post nine eleven trauma discourse. Uh, <laughs> you got uh, it. Um, gosh, what have I been up to lately? Um, I ended up reading most of. Ron, Sw- or Ron Swanson's, um, Nick Offerman's book, RJ. Oh, yeah? But I've not finished it quite yet. So um, paddle your own canoe. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. I agree. It's one I of his books. Have, it is one. It is a book of all time. No, it's pretty good. <laughs> um. So, But yeah, I was on a trip where I read most of it, and then I just haven't taken the time since I got home. Fair. Um, I'm like that with some... the, the book We Free Men by Terry Pratchett. Books are for convenience, not for education. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is that school. Yeah. 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 Books are lame and, wait, and, wait, and hang parents on. suck. Hang on. Hold on. Hang on. Wait a minute. <laughs> what? We said books are for convenience, not education. You still read the yeah. book. Yeah. Fuck books that. Books are dude. good. We just don't use them to learn. No book is ever. <laughs> No book, book at the RJ, RJ. You <laughs> sir, if we want to get had, serious on this, you sir cannot be degrading books. You were the kid who every oh. year had to clean out his <laughs> desk of library books. You've written a book. I remember both. <laughs> hey, I'm aware. <laughs> I what I'm what I'm saying is, if anything, they are they have done neutral at the best. They have done neutral. At best, people. they've done neutral. Said the literal book hoarder. Yeah, I'm being a dick right now. No, I love books. I think they're awesome. I think it's probably like maybe the best thing that human beings have. It's pretty fucking smart. Um, as it is, it's pretty smart. Without it, we wouldn't have all the other stuff that we have, basically. So, 
Yeah, it is a very efficient way of passing things down. It um, is. Maybe not quite as efficient as the developments in the internet in the last uh, I'd argue it's decades, more efficient but... if you're talking about longevity. I don't know if we know enough about internet technology to make that claim yet. But we know That's enough true. about digital files, and CDs, and memory hard drives. I mean, I'm sure the first books weren't great either. These are just evolutions on the storage medium. That's very. That's, fair, that's a very good point. But Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> I'll be there. We don't have any two terabyte hard drives laying around from well, yeah. thousands of years ago. I, I did look up the like the lifespan of a t of a hard drive the other day just to be like, hey, should I be concerned about this? And they're like, oh yeah, you know, hard drive usually lasts about like four or five years. It's like cool. That's Whoa. also a good point. Well, uh, DVDs last like ten years. Well. That's just I, with I, active use of them, though. I, I mean, I, and there are ways to. There are deep digital archives. Like there are ways. I, because I know that one of the one of the critiques heavily against like the internet. Because I agree, I agree, John. But one of the critiques is like, yeah, but you know, let's say there's a freak natural incident that you know, like a suns a sunspot, like something with like that, yeah. yeah, right, and it and it just wipes everything out in a blackout, like. All your data, like we're talking, all like what if the YouTube servers got hit? You know, com completely. Like, when, what if they just when Amazon decides it's not going to support the internet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the only issue is that it is it functions because it's like I mean, if you think about it, the internet is just essentially it's a giant human brain that's just all over the planet, um, and it needs you know fuel to continually operate. Books are. Books are alive, but they're also very dead, you know, so they're easy to transport and uh, they're, they do, they do fade though. I mean, I don't think books, I don't think without care, books will fade in a yes. hundred years, you know? Um, yeah. And unlike internet media, they are much more difficult to actually get through because if you think of like what a movie can so do or even tablets. a fucking, well, yeah, but what <laughs> I'm going saying back is like to stone tablets. Metal what no, tablets. what I'm what I'm saying is is mentally like you know when you make uh, if you make a video or if you watch something like a video you know there's usually a human voice and there's like an interplay of light and sound as well as like you know ideally uh, some higher cognitive function if you're watching something that's like intellectually stimulating and I'm not gonna say that's like better than a book because i think a book trains you to basically like i think a book trains you in empathy and i think it trains you in discipline like you are literally taking mm -hmm. in someone's thoughts as your own and you have to consciously do so you have to do it no one is going to make you read or turn the pages for you you have to go out and do that you know a video you can just sit down and it'll play automatically it's a gonna video run. Can brainwash you well many things can brainwash you um a you know Three, three, uh, three handsome young men on a on a on an underground podcast could brainwash you. So be careful. You never know when they'll strike. Yes. But, where would we ever find a podcast with three white men on it? Uh, Dude, they're getting. I don't know. You know they're, yeah, they're they're. <laughs> some say the rarest of species, actually. Um, <laughs> That's I mean, a did good you point, though. Sorry. Did you learn anything from uh, Nick Hoffman's book? Do you have any? Uh, any tips that you can pass on from him Insight. to us? Him I am us? like, <laughs> I'm weirdly jealous of his upbringing on a farm. Yeah. Um, which is kind of silly because it sounds like a, a lot of hard work, but he's a very capable individual because of it. Yeah. <laughs> definitely one of those. You don't have a choice. Uh, you're being voluntold to go farm the fields. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes I get really sad that most of my, uh, like contribution to the world is digital but uh i'm learning and it's it's, so. it's so wild that his upbringing resulted in an actor like yeah. just statistically speaking the yeah but he also um like references how it, in hindsight it just was the only thing that made sense for him yeah so i don't know that's a good lesson i also kind of want to build a boat now um <laughs> yep <laughs> is that what he does? Yeah. Dude can build boats. He's like, you will never know. 
it's the true a... joy as good as building your own canoe and paddling down the river in it. The problem with the like Nick Offerman trying to distance himself from Ron Swanson is he is Ron Swanson in terms of the skills. Like yeah, but they yeah. just filmed in his actual wood shop. <laughs> I was watching, um, like, the Parks and Rec YouTube channel has clips every once in a while, and there was just, like, Ron Swanson, but getting progressively more Ron. And, like, I could definitely see how Nick Offerman's different than the character yeah. after reading that book. Oh, for sure. Like, Ron Swanson will not be doing mushrooms in the woods. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely much more, I think he's much more of, like, a hippie than, obviously, Ron Swanson oh, yeah. is. But it's funny, because he combines, like... Like very California hippieish. I think he was. I want to say he was born in Illinois. Yeah, or he's he went from to like Illinois. school yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Both. Um, he went to school in Illinois as well. He's like the embodiment of the Walt Whitman. I contradict myself very well. I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. Yeah. Well said, RJ. Well said. Yeah. He's he's very much so. Very much so. My favorite piece of advice from the book is to make handmade cards. Mm. I want. Oh. I keep intending to do that more and then it. But he's like, yeah. Anybody can go out and buy a Hallmark card. Like, there's so much more, like, intention and, like, love in a handmade card. That's true. That's Um, really true. He also tells his wife a lot of dirty jokes. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, references to oral sex in the book. Very cool. (laughs) Hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. My man's getting it. That's good. Good Good for him. The man's giving it. Oh. The man's given. It's giving oral sex. It's giving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. I'm Nick gonna find Offerman everything you love, and I'm gonna... talks about how innuendos on going down on his wife. Yeah, dude, so cool. Does he have detailed diagrams? No, um, but he does detail uh, the fact that he took a risk on asking her out because she was already a TV star. Yeah. And she was like, oh, this is new and interesting because you're not a skinny boy, skinny jeans, emo guy. Sure, let's let's try this. <laughs> oh, you're treating me like a person and not a celebrity. Wow. Weird. Yeah. Crazy. Um, the other thing that resonated with me was at one point he's talking about like how people maybe seek escapism too much between like TV shows and video games and whatnot. Um. And I was just really wondering what he would have to say about that today, because the book is like 2011. I don't know how old the book is, but it's at least a decade Hang old. Hang on, I can tell you. I already got my copy off the shelf. He's like, people's attention spans are so short, and that was uh, like a decade before TikTok. Copyright 2013. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It, it was definitely a good recommendation. I've enjoyed the majority of the book that I've read so far. Um... Dude's led an interesting life. Yeah. Cool. Our next segment is how to be a better buddy or give some real and some humorous advice. And James, because you've mentioned a few times to me, uh, we've got a very D&D heavy segment this week. I don't know how many we'll get through because the D&D ones are a little longer. Uh, But first this week, Druid completely bogs down combat. With the details, my circle of the shepherd Druid just turned level 5 and learned the spell Conjure Animals. This allowed him to, in the first combat of level 5, spawn 8 wolves and give them plus 10 temporary HP with a spirit totem. The next turn, he spawned a spirit animal. This is cool and all, but he basically had to control 10 creatures and his turns legitimately lasted longer than the turns of every other PC and enemy combined. Not to mention so many dice were thrown for the wolves attacks. The wolves even had advantage on attack rolls because of pack tactics. That we only realized later that there had been mistakes in the attack rolls. Do you have any suggestions to make his turns shorter or simpler to play other than just forcing him to spawn a maximum of two CR1 creatures instead of eight CR quarter ones? Kind of ridiculous that my wizard can go, I cast fireball and deal 28 damage, and then has to wait seven minutes for the druid to finish playing with his wolves. I guess, in my mind, my suggestion would be to treat them as a block. You like... I don't know. Yeah. You roll for them to hit once and you roll one set of damage and then kind of just distribute it as makes sense or feel like brutally cripple him um 
yeah. what f- field an enemy that he thinks he's going to be able to beat, but will suffer a pure victory. And to what end? He walks in. <laughs> yeah, just kill the character. Actually, no, don't kill him. But to the to because like I feel like uh, taking up so much time. It's like it's a great uh, dude. It's like a perfect character setup. Are you kidding me? That's like the perfect like. Uh, slightly innocuous kind of hubristic arrogance uh like base foundation that's perfect for a little mini character arc about like learning to do things like a little more efficiently and not take up people's time you know like so like i think part of it is the like okay he did this the one time how many more times is he going to do this right like it's the first combat they had where he had this ability so okay. of course the first time you're gonna you, you can use it you're gonna summon all of the wolves because wolves are awesome and get pack tactics but i'm yeah. sure he was also feeling the frustration of like oh my god i've got seven goddamn wolves and my spirit animal and i gotta do my shit or eight wolves sorry yeah because that means he's rolling at minimum assuming his druid doesn't do anything and is just commanding all of these spawns he has at minimum 18 d20 or no 16 d20s he's rolling if all of the wolves have pack tactics going plus another d20 for his spirit animal which means yeah, that's, crazy. that's nine attacks doing the math on all those rolls like it's just a lot and so if he, there's a chance maybe he realizes that too so the yeah. real strategy here is just to buy enough dice Color code them and roll them all at once. <laughs> oh yeah, actually that's good. <laughs> that I like is that. one thing. You also were on a yeah. really good track, John, with the like put them as a block. Yeah. Like, absolutely put them as a block. Even if you just grouped it up into like, okay, we got two sets of four wolves. We roll all these wolf dice at once. We roll all those wolf dice at once. Call it good. Yeah. Or if he does it the next time, just teach him a lesson. Take him outside and curb stomp him. Or open yeah. his mouth up, put his front teeth on the curb, and then you just slam down really hard on the back Ooh. of the second through you. No, 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 James, please. That's That doesn't teach a lesson, that just teaches pain. It's just, it's just a prank. Right, what you do You're right. <laughs> is he has to bring a pack of wolves to the next session and have them train. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a real pack of wolves. Yeah. yeah. You have to set him out All the, the woods. He All needs the to other go players woods, require... Get eight wolves. <laughs> Wait. Train him up. Bring him in. All the other players require what? What did you say? Um, I was saying he should bring in a puppy for every other player as uh, as payment. So they get to play <laughs> with the puppy while they're waiting for him. Aww. <laughs> That's so sweet. But realistically, yeah, just uh, come up with like a block solution or just uh, um, maybe even like talk to them about spawning a maximum of two CR creatures, but like at yeah. the end of the day, propose a solution and then talk it through with them. Yeah. And find something that works for both of you and the yeah. rest of your party. Also, I feel like you could come up with some pretty cool solutions. There's no way the druid is the only one who like takes time on combat. Like any other spellcaster is, they may be thinking ahead of time, but they definitely have to, like, adjust as the battlefield changes and be like, okay, I was going to do this spell, but that doesn't work anymore, so now I guess I'm going to do this. But yeah. Is there any way he could just field one, and then is there, yeah, like, an so the way the spell, or a spell? And that's, yeah, that's part of the okay. question down there is, like, uh, do you have any suggestions to make his turn shorter or simpler to play other than just forcing him to spawn a maximum of two CR1 creatures? So he can spawn okay. uh, with the spell... Um, he can spawn X number of animals, but they have to be a combined, basically combined, like, CR amount, right? So, like, a total of CR2. Combat what rating 2. What do you mean two. CR? Okay, okay. So, like, he can do two combat rating 1 creatures, or eight combat rating 1 quarter creatures, because four of those equal to one. Yeah, well, why would you... I, is it just the idea that with more creatures you have a greater probability yep. of success? Basically, okay. um, especially um, because the wolves have a, the ability packed tactics, where if they're if they have an ally next to the enemy they're attacking, they get advantage. So it makes it even more likely to get hit. And 
with eight of them all going with the advantage, it's that much more likely you'll crit that more that much more often. I can see that. I mean, I would say like I know he they said like other than that, but I would literally just I mean that to me seems like a just figure out a way to fairly like split the th- those abilities. Like it could still they could still have pack tactics. And you could still feel just one or two. I feel it's like the, if you work. It's out the a, problem a where you place solution. your efficiency. Uh, okay. In this instance, he's putting efficiency in. If I do this many more rolls per turn. I am that yeah. much more likely to get criticals, which means I'm much more likely to end things quicker. Well, you could Whereas always the split the difference. other area of efficiency would yeah. be, oh, because we're moving through turns quicker, it makes it more likely for everybody to get critical. It's not necessarily more likely for dice rolls to get criticals, but it's getting through turns quicker so that people can contribute. Why don't you just split the difference in both and say, like, okay, so you can only field one or two of these creatures, but they have, like, uh, a certain level of advantage on their... Uh, and you wouldn't uh, need to do that. Roles. You wouldn't need to worry about that, really, because the with the CR1, it means they're going to be higher-powered creatures to begin with. So just okay. by doing, like, crit- uh, challenge rating one creatures, they're going to be stronger. All right. Our next question... Advice on potentially kill a uh, potentially PC killing ruling. Play stupid games, fall off of airships. With the further details, hello, I would like to preface that if Isbeth, JJ, Sandy, Mina, or Desmil sound familiar, go away. During an encounter that our session ended in the middle of, my players, at level six, were battling on a docked airship about two hundred feet above the freezing depths of the ocean. Much of the fighting was taking place on the gangplank to the ship, including the big bad evil guy's lieutenant, a beefed up bone knight. Uh, standing on the bulwark of the ship, Slash end of the gangplank. Gangplank. Given the ship's location, one of my players had the bright idea to lasso the bone knight and throw herself off, pulling him with her. She managed to catch him, but failed the contested check in trying to pull him off. Where we left the la- the session was with her hanging over the side of the gangplank, the bone knight's turn next. She, being our druid, has multiple spells prepared that could help her out of the jam, although before she did any of this, I warned that it might be hard, but possible, to cast a spell while falling at ever-increasing rates. I don't want to kill her, but the only logical thing for the Bone Knight to do would be to cut the rope holding him with his next action slash attack. Additional, possibly important context is that, through the player's actions and dice rolls, one of the other PCs was killed in the session before this. Having two people die in quick succession feels really not good, but I feel like hand-waving the massive risk she took would sort of get rid of any tension. Essentially, I'm wondering how on earth I should rule this to give her a chance of surviving the 200-foot drop without just waving away the consequences of their actions or if guaranteed survival is the play here. I would much appreciate any advice or thoughts you all have. So wait, summar- summarize this All right, really so quick they're, again, they're so... on this airship, 200 feet above the ocean. Okay. They're fighting on the gangplank. Bad guy, yep. the Bone Knight, is standing at the edge. Druid was like, hey, what if I lasso him and jump off the side to drag him off the edge? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Bone Knight won that, so the Druid was just hanging off the side of the edge with this rope while the Bone Knight is still standing up there with this rope <laughs> around him. Theoretically, the next turn, the Bone Knight could just, like, cut the rope, and the Druid falls 200 feet into the water, and dies slash drowns. Um, could, you, could you consider him grappled? Would he be able to cut the rope? Um, it'd be interesting. Um, he's lassoed, so he might not have full use of his arms, depending on how the lasso is <laughs> set. That definitely would be context that would be helpful. I would say... It- depends on how the dm ruled it originally terms it sounds like the dm ruled it of like not being grappled just because they said like oh the next turn the bone knight can like cut the rope um okay. fair enough but i definitely as a dm would consider that as a possibility of just being like oh the bone knight's grappled which gives them that opening to like figure out what to do next yeah like at least get a turn to deal with it yeah and then if they don't deal with it, then yeah, they can die. <laughs> and honestly, I think the other thing you can do, because assuming the rope is a standard 50-foot rope from D- they're at least, like, 45 feet down. At least. That's a good distance, and it's out of range of a lot of spell, of a decent number of spells. Like, it's it's borderline range for a number of spells. So you could just have the Bone Knight be like, alright, well, you're hanging off the side of this. I don't need to worry about you for the moment, because you're down there. I'm going to go after the people who are still up here attacking me. Mm. That way, players can, like, keep going. Druid doesn't get auto-killed and gives them a little bit. And if the Druid doesn't do anything to actually, like, help themselves out, then 
but the battle is clearly like one that the good guys are going to win. Like your players are obviously going to win this. So it doesn't matter if the bone knight cuts the rope, like the players are about to win. You can cut the rope because then you can do like, okay, you're falling. What are you going to do to save yourself? See what the other players do to try and help out too. Hmm. Yeah. I suppose there's an extra element there. I'm like, but then we're back where we started. <laughs> cut rope and falling. There's the Pyrrhic victory James was talking about. You win the battle but at the cost of your druid. Yeah. yeah. Seeing all is lost the Bone Knight cuts the rope. Because again, To like, get one victory in. Especially level 6. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure druids would have access. They'd at least have access to things with swim speed. Um. Um. Ooh. Not yet. Level 8. Level 8 druids can it's, shapeshift it's, into <laughs> flying things. Just gotta um, meditate and power level real quick. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I might have found something else. Ooh. The Deus Ex Machina double airship. So one move they could do is uh, a reformed... There's a new wild companion feature. One of the options being summon an owl. And there's, at level 5, you can summon... Uh, creatures literally we just talked about conjure animals so they could conjure an animal but then become a smaller animal and ride on it so if they conjure like an owl uh. or an eagle or something and wild shape into a spider or a rat or something and just ride it back up so you go from falling to death to getting eaten by your conjured owl yeah <laughs> that's fine that's fine yeah i don't know i it it's rough that the uh, context would result in a second player death if this went through. Because it's like, yeah, you jumped off an airship, you should probably get punished for that. I think it's also con like context for the campaign overall, right? Of like, Curse of Strahd is a campaign where you're expected to die. Like, it's supposed to be brutal. I think we only had one person who... No, yeah, one person didn't have a character death out of six people playing. Like, well, some campaigns are intended to be hard like that. So if that's the tone of your campaign, just kill him. But if it's not, just be okay with like, oh, yep, uh, hand wave this one for the betterment of the party and everybody having fun. Yeah, I feel like that contextual, uh, that's fair. Or, if you want to keep the tension, here's what you do. You drop him. Let him drop. And the party is distracted by the battle. All they see is their druid falling to the water. And give the druid the chance to try some spells, but if they fail, after the, in the confusion of the fight, nobody sees what happens to the druid. That's all you tell them. And then you work with the druid and say, okay, you've just been saved by a bunch of sea elves who saw you and used their uh, magic over the water to gen cushion your fall and uh, save you, and now you're indebted to them. Boom. Added some new context, saved everybody without it being completely, uh, void of consequences. And that, my friends, is why RJ is the DM. And why I'm an annoyance to my current DMs, because I backseat DM. <laughs> <laughs> RJ. RJ. I try not to. RJ. But... Last week, Tuesday, we were did it. We finally got around to starting the session, and uh, I, I really appreciate Alex. He's a great DM, but he's very good about letting us just like run with stuff if we're having fun. Like he'll just let us go, and I kind of took over and started asking the other players of like, oh, so we we get up in the morning and we head out downstairs and we start having our breakfast, and Alex is like, you do, and I was like, yep, we do. I'm in charge now. RJ's railroading the party. Some player, player. <laughs> player number two, what do you have for breakfast? <laughs> Yikes. I don't know if I like that, friend. No, it, it, it was joking. Like, it, I don't actually DM DM. At most, oh, RJ. Uh, with the my Thursday night campaign, I'll, like, step in to help with rules stuff when it's very apparent that, like, it's appropriate to step in and help clarify. <laughs> But it's always a respect the respect the DM's call, the DM's ruling, and what they're doing. Good, good, good. Yep. And with that, I think that's the end of, for this week. 
Thank you both for joining. All right. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off Yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are sold, and I have to sneeze again. It's just stuck in my nose. <laughs> yeah, it's just stuck there. That's fun. Okay. <laughs> Our social media, Facebook, is Better Buddies. Our Twitter account is at Better Budcast, or X. They're finally changing the URL. And our Gmail is betterbuddiescast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love and or war, icebreakers you want us to answer, or questions you need advice on. Our YouTube channel, Better Buddies. It's the purple logo with the Comic Sans white font. You can't miss it. Uh, go go give us a subscribe and a like. And if you liked the D&D advice, let us know. We'll do more of it. Last but not least, be a better buddy. How's everyone been? Good. For the most part, pretty good. Glad yeah. it's warm. Me too. Summer is officially here. Summer. Work has been I'll very be a chill. happy snowman. That's good. That's good. I'm not a snowman. Anyone ha- What do you mean you're not a snowman? Well, John said he'd be a happy snowman, as per Olaf oh. from Frozen. Ah, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> and I am not a snowman. <laughs> Old Mr. Josh Gad.